You know, I know that in some ways I'm probably the only thing standing between you and a lot of free drinks. <laughs> yeah, so my good friends from Oklahoma say, well, hell, hurry up. <laughs> thank you, Ed, for hosting today's event. Uh, and thank you, House of Delegates, for the opportunity to serve our profession. Welcome, colleagues, friends, family. We need to talk about some things that are important for our present circumstances and to our future. About putting the challenges of the present into context with our history. About recognizing how many of our challenges are actually opportunities to help shape our own future. and about the tools we will need to keep us on course as we continue on the journey of the osteopathic profession. As many of you know, I talk a lot about culture and I've been thinking a lot about the importance of culture. As mentioned yesterday, uh, Dr. Nichols um, often quotes Peter Drucker that culture eats strategy for lunch every day. Now, you're probably wondering why I have this picture up here. What is culture? It's a shared set of interests, skills, values, goals, or experiences. It's a common heritage. It could be ethnic, military, professional, sports, or business. It's collegial, it's passionate, and there's a sense of commitment to those common interests. Now, the reason I have this picture on here is the obvious answer is that I'm a surfer. Now, I will have to qualify that. Thanks to the hospitality of many people and organizations that are represented in this room, I've been having such, so much good food and drink that now when I paddle out, I'm more worried about getting harpooned <laughs> than catching a wave. But the less obvious answer is this picture represents a culture. This picture is the constant journey of the surfer. Surfers are in search of the perfect wave. In our surf culture, we also have equipment, techniques, lingo, rad, awesome. You heard my friend Pat say awesome, which is common terminology. Shaka, gnarly dude. We got a lot of that cool. But we're a family with a shared passion for common interests for the sport of surfing. Now, our DO profession has a strong culture. Clearly, we have a passion for what we believe in. We find our own lingo and interests and skills, which you're all dedicated to. You've reaffirmed those distinctive skills just in the last 24 hours, haven't you? But I've been trying to find some commonality in these two disparate cultures. I was wondering how to share a cultural commitment to both passions. And that made me think of branding, because with our surfboards, we say, you know, I ride a Stuart, I ride a Rusty, uh, I ride a, a, a Dewey Weber, but I've decided to create a new brand of surfboard. You see it there. I'm getting ready to ride my new DO, right? <laughs> and just to reinforce, I brought it along today. You know, we, in our lingo, we say if a board really rides well, it shreds. This board manipulates. <laughs> so what's the point of all this? Is, or as uh, Carl Pesta has said before, does this train of thought have a caboose? <laughs> right? Well, it's about culture. And culture is important. 
It is the glue that holds us together. It's the key to sustainability. It holds the Surf family together, and it holds the Dio family together. It has for 139 years. Let's flash back to 139 years ago. Post-Civil War chaos in medical practice, a lot of conflicting theories, purging, bleeding, leeches. You heard Dr. Kirpin describe in his AT Still lecture this morning about how an MD evolved a vision of a new philosophy of health and disease. Principles and techniques designed to supplement, not replace, all other available treatment modalities. And he combined this philosophy with an emphasis on a humanistic approach and on evaluating and treating the whole patient. Now that seems self-evident to us today, but his road wasn't easy. Despite a loyal following of grateful patients, despite other practitioners that wanted to learn his principles and share his vision, it was rejected by the mainstream medical community. It was too different from current medical thinking. It was too disruptive. He and his fellow practitioners were branded as a cult. But we know that life is a marathon and not a sprint. Dr. Still never gave up. Despite many challenges and seemingly unsurmountable obstacles, he remained deeply committed to his beliefs. He was stubborn. Eventually, the School of Medicine became known as osteopathy, which we know as osteopathic medicine today. The early DOs were passionate about a common vision, values, and skills. They had a lingo, and most importantly, a sense of family. They stuck together. The DOs weren't a cult. They were a culture. And they endured. And our profession has remained strong today. And we have many bright spots. There's more than 100,000 DOs, about 102. More than 83,000 of those or, I'm sorry, more than 100,000 in our profession and about 83,000 in DOs. But here's a fascinating fact. We did some research this year. Many of you may not know that since our inception, only about 105,000 DOs have received the DO degree. And of those, 80% earned their degree in the last 40 years. It's an interesting fact, isn't it? 20% of all medical students are enrolled in osteopathic medical schools. We've been listed as the fastest growing healthcare profession in the United States. Our degree is recognized for full licensure in 66 countries. And our legacy is a sustainable profession. We've overcome many discrimination battles. We've in uh, endured incredible challenges. We've survived. We've prospered. And the challenges continue. One of the current challenges is GME, but that's not a new issue. Arnold Melnick, who published a whole series of essays that you may remember in the DO magazine, once wrote that in 1945, when he graduated from PCOM, only one in three graduates could get a GME slot, one in three. And I'll tell you another story about another PCOM graduate who in 1941 graduated and could not get an internship or a residency. And he knew he needed to make a living. He didn't have many opportunities. So he heard a story of a country doctor down in Texas, East Texas, that was looking for an associate. And he went down there. He gave up everything he knew, went down there, ended up in a small town in the middle of the night with only a lone cow mooing in the distance. That's the truth. And he went to work for this doctor, and it was like culture shock. He was overwhelmed. First of all, country medicine was probably a little barbaric back then. And he certainly didn't feel that he had the skills to even be ready for that. So he left there and practically broke. He took a bus into Dallas, Texas, the nearest big city, 
because he heard there was a DO hospital there and a DO named Sam Sparks. You guys from Texas know who I'm talking about. And he walked into this complete stranger and said, I don't know what to do. I don't have any training. I'm broke. I, I don't know what to do, where to go. I've got to make a success of myself. I, I just need some time to think. And he said, well, why don't you put your stuff down in the basement, relax, go into the dining room, get a good meal, get a good night's sleep. We'll talk in the morning. So the next day, Sam came in and said, uh, you know, why don't you just stick around for a little while until you get your your thoughts together and your plans made, but while you're here, would you mind seeing a few patients? Always, people always love to get something for free food, you know. Uh, and so uh, he said, well, sure, I'm getting free food, I'm getting a place to sleep. And uh, so he started seeing patients. Weeks turned into months. Once in a while, Sam would walk in, hand him five dollars, and said, you know, you've been working awful hard. Go to dinner. Go see a movie. And then he'd keep going. The months went on. And one day, it had been about a year, Sam walks in. He goes, you know, i got something for you here. He says, what's that? He says, it's your internship certificate. You just completed an internship. That person was my father. So what does Ed Vin's journey symbolize? Endurance. Commitment. Stubbornness. And I got to tell you, he was one stubborn guy. And that we take care of our family members and support them. It was the kindness of strangers, another member of the DO family that pulled him out of a tough spot. And it is our legacy and our destiny to continue the journey as a professional family and overcome the challenges that lay before us. And we will overcome those challenges. I've been on my own osteopathic journey for 40 years, from Texas to Philadelphia to Michigan to California, and ultimately to a national role where I'm honored to serve you today. Now, in Texas, and I keep referring to my roots back there, folks, we have a saying, don't we? It says, I'm going to dance with them what brung me, right? And I want to thank some people that have helped me on this journey. First and foremost, my wife, Marcia. Marcia, come up here. Yeah, come up here. Now, you've got to know that I, I met Marcia in my internship in Michigan. I took her home to Texas on the holidays. You know, I wanted to uh, introduce my parents to this beautiful new girl, my mother, who was a diehard Texan woman. Uh, and she liked Marcia. And she turned to me and goes, Norm, she's pretty nice for a little Yankee girl. <laughs> so, Marcia. You're the light of my life. Thank you. Oh. Doing good. I have something for you. Dr. Morrison. This is special for you. Thank you for acknowledging the little Yankee girl. Okay. All right. Thank you. My daughters, you saw in the video, Vanessa, the other Dr. Vin. That's how I refer to her. Lily. Lily's a sophomore at Ole Miss with her Mississippi mama and papa, Bill Mayo and Sherry Mayo. Uh, we're not sure what we're ma she's majoring in. We think it may be sorority. And Danielle, the poet, who did such a great job of putting that video together. She did a pretty good job. And my other friends and family members, for those of you present, I'm so honored to have you here with me today. This is a great day to share with you. And to my parents, you know, to Ed Vin. He was a character, but he was a great guy. And uh, I miss him. And my mother. She was a politician in the family. She, my father never talked to anybody, I mean, other than his patients. He was very quiet, kind of shy, and uh, never held any leadership roles. He was just a good doctor. My mother was the politician. That's why she was up there as the president of the Texas Auxiliary. And it was Rita Baker that actually found that picture. So thank you, Rita, 
for recovering a little piece of history there. Osteopathic physicians and surgeons of California, my colleagues, friends, soulmates in many ways, surf buds like Greg Peckia, Adam Crawford, Blake Wiley, my college, Osteopathic, American College of Osteopathic Family Physicians. They've been very supportive, just a great group of people. And my mentors, the AOA past presidents, who I didn't even know the connections and how they would last when my mentors from Michigan were so great early on, so supportive, such great teachers and role models. But especially Don Kirpin, my lifetime career long mentor. Don, stand up and be acknowledged. What a great speech this morning from Don, huh? You, the House of Delegates, thank you for your support. And John Crosby, 16 years of service, John. You've been, we've been kidding John, he's been on the victory tour here for several months. And he deserves every bit of it for being such a great part of our lives. My fellow AOA trustees who have been so supportive and been just great partners to work with as we struggled with really thorny issues. And the leaders of our, and members of our bureaus, councils, and committees, many of whom are in the audience today and some of whom aren't, but are so diligent. It's a volunteerism labor of love. And most importantly, Ray Stowers, you inspired us to better ourselves, to improve the level of care provided to our patients, and to stay ahead of our curve. Thank you, Ray. Stand up. Now, our journey is going to continue. On any journey, there are going to be rocks in the road when you're surfing. There's bumps in the reef. But are they challenges or are they opportunities? Thomas Edison once said, opportunities are often missed because they're dressed in overalls and they look like work. <laughs> dressed in overalls and look like work. Things don't always go as planned. We get knocked off. In surfing, that's what going over the falls we call a wipeout. But we paddle back out and we keep going. We don't give up. There's uncertainties in our future, uncertainties about the Affordable Care Act, the SGR, the growth parad paradox that Don pointed out so eloquently this morning. We're growing. But on our studies, affinity to our profession has declined. And despite our growth, our market share is declining nationally in many states. We measure that. We watch it very carefully. With 60% of, uh, of our graduates going into ACGME, Don pointed out that only about 10% of them stay in the AOA. That's a fixable problem. That doesn't have to be that way. And of course, we have this pending mis mismatch of demand and capacity in the ACGME situation, which, as, as John said, was our finest hour. Extraordinary show of unity. <laughs> the single pathway issue remains. We're well aware of that. But to the students, residents, and others affected by these challenges, I need to reassure you personally that we will do everything in our power to preserve existing career opportunities and to create new ones. We're with you. We're there for you. This is wicked strategy either way. Despite these opportunities that look like work, our future remains bright. We hear from all sorts of sectors that we are the key to what's missing in health care. We have a strong cultural foundation. We have endured for 139 years. We're a family. That's very important. And we are a well-organized minority. Margaret Mead once said, 
A small, well-organized group can change the world. In fact, it's the only thing that ever has. So that's us. That's us. So we're on this journey together, and we're going to prevail. So what are our next steps? Stephen Covey says, first things first. We are aggressively and effectively managing a very smooth transition for our executive director to our dynamic new executive director, Adrian White Fains, whom you're going to meet tomorrow. Ray Stowers and I have been planning this transition for a whole year. We started out talking about how to make a smooth continuum between what Ray was doing and what I was going to do, and I've already started working with Bob Uhas about being sure there's a smooth integration between his priorities and the things that I hope are, we're going to achieve this year. But we also need to begin with the end in mind. Where do we want to be? We always talk about being great. We have our great pathways in our strategic plan, governance, research, education, advocacy, teamwork. We're going to follow that plan. We need to harness and reinforce the strength of our culture to preserve our unity. We can have both culture and strategy for lunch. That's our opportunity here. And we need to establish some guiding principles. Now, what do I mean by guiding principles? They're, they're like a litmus test. They're like the signposts on our journey into the future that we use to read. Are we on course? Are we drifting off course? We can, we can test things we're thinking about doing. Are these where we ought to be? Should we be changing course a little bit? And I have some of them I'm going to talk with you about today. Innovation and evolution. They go hand in hand. Will Rogers said, even if you're on the right track, if you're not moving fast enough, the train's going to run you over. This is not your father's AOA. This is not my father's AOA, nor should it be. We have got to continually involve, evolve our management processes, our governance processes. We need to be more nimble, more efficient, how we make best use of limited resources. We need new business models, non-dues revenues that will reduce dependence on our dues and the burden on you, our members. We need new alliances internally, externally to enhance our influence and our impact. Winston Churchill said the only thing worse than fighting with your allies is fighting without them. So we need to get past any disagreements. We're sure we're going to have points of disagreements, but we need to look at the big picture, look beyond that. We need to look at our new educational models, which you heard a presentation here, the Blue Ribbon Commission. Customer-centric has a broader definition it's not just the patient, it's payers, it's integrated delivery systems, it's hospital systems. We need to turn out a physician that's efficient and ready to work in that context. Diffusion. The Board of Trustees receives voluminous reading materials from outside sources, journal articles, government studies. Strategic Planning Committee receives a lot of those. They review that, they digest that. But there's no franchise in this information. It's not confidential. So we're developing what we call the Leaders Program. I mentioned at uh, lunch today that we're very good at acronyms. I guess I'm just as much subject to that as anyone. The Leaders Program stands for Leadership, Education, and Development Resources. But the whole idea is to start diffusing all this information to a broader base in our profession so that we can raise the bar of our knowledge, raise the bar of our thinking, raise the bar of our planning, and work toward the really important issues together. Relevance. Charles Schwab said, ask the customer what they want. Will Rogers stated it much more simply. He says, when you're riding out in front of the herd, you better look back once in a while and make sure they're still behind you. Now, we have all these targeted segments in our profession. It's like, you know, like a company that has different types of customers. You are the guardians of the profession here. You and I have all drank the Kool-Aid. We're the loyal troops. But what about the millennials, the ACGME trainees, our increasing cadre of specialists? We need to be sure we're meeting their needs. We may maintain and increase affinity to the AOA and to the profession. 
partly the way you do that is through engagement. We had some speakers here over the years that have talked about the importance of just being involved, not even in a big way, but maybe a small way. We're all pretty engaged. That's why we're here. But we can do better at creating a better sense of engagement, particularly with our third and fourth year students. As Don said, they're out there. Where are they training? Who are their role models? What's their connection? And in those graduate medical education years, whether it's OGME or GME, we need to create a sense of connectivity. How to stay connected to the DO family. There's a lot of mentorship going on out there in various sectors that is oriented toward great career planning and great educational choices. But what about just teaching people how to stay connected and why you should stay connected? That's something we can do. The Council of Interns and Residents started off on an extraordinary initiative and the visionary one that they wanted to form the ambassadors program and I believe they've got is 58 they have of their, from the residence program. I believe it's 58 ambassadors that are supposed to be create better connection to the residents. We've also re-engineered the President's Advisory Council and they're also going to be ambassadors, the whole cadre of them that are willing to serve and the goal is to try to touch those thousand residencies out there and touch all those DOs and not only teach them about educational pathways but to teach them why they're a part of a family, why it's good to be a part of a family and how to stay connected with the family. And we need to be inclusive. I bet everybody in this room knows a DO that in the 70s or the early 80s was a good DO, but they wanted to take MD training because it was close to them, or it was the best possible training they could get. And we all know somebody that was told, if you go take that MD training, don't bother to come back. I call them the lost generation. We need to reach out to those people. Even if they don't come back, we let them know that they were not rebels. They were pioneers. They were innovators. We need to lower, constantly look at ways to lower the barriers to re-engage with the profession. Ease the restrictions on eligibility for program directors. Now, I know that's a thorny issue, but these are guys that believe in the profession. We need to pay it forward, stewardship. Remember the movie, Pay It Forward? We need to be role models. And we need to encourage other people in our profession to be role models, to lay down the paving stones for the road to the future and help others create, have the opportunities that were created for us. We're going to enhance the effectiveness and reach of the mentor program. We looked at doing a full re-engineering this year, but the first thing we said is let's do an inventory. You know, we gave out a STAR award today to Ohio because of their efforts to do a state-level mentorship program. We have some specialty societies doing mentorship programs. We have an AOA mentorship program. That was in, an innovation of, uh, and, and a recommendation of Dr. Darrell Beeler. It survives today. It was great, and it remains great, but it could even be better. And we want to eliminate the redundancy and the overlap, and we want to identify the best practices. We just need to know who's mentoring who. That'd probably be a good start. And we can do all that. Our final guiding principle is celebration. Celebration, if you read much about culture and history, is the cornerstone of a strong culture. We honor and celebrate our great heroes, our, our, our great pioneers. We get some honoring of some very special heroes today. But we need to celebrate you, the guardians of the profession. You've served the profession in leadership roles, state, county, national, and you know other people, your predecessors and role models that served in these. You're all guardians of the profession. And like the Marines, we need to celebrate the guys on the front lines. You all know people living and deceased like my father. They didn't serve any roles, I mean, any leadership roles, but they were great role models. 
And as we say in our pledge, they lived every day as an example of what an osteopathic physician should be. Now, the best thing if you're going to work on something like that is to get started. And we're going to get started today. Since each one of you, I know, knows guardians and you know unsung heroes, we're going to do what the salespeople call induce an active commitment. I'm going to ask you actively to join me in paying homage to the unsung heroes and guardians of our profession. I'm going to ask that before you leave this ceremony, you complete some recommendation forms which the pages are going to pass out and we have boxes out front. And I'm going to ask every one of you to come up with an unsung hero, at least one, you can come up with more, and a guardian and put them in that box out there. Our goal is to leave this House of Delegates with 400 guardians and 400 unsung heroes and we're going to recognize and celebrate them at OMED in September. As we get the word out on this in our social media and our website, we want to try to hit 1,000 of each by OMED, 2,000 by the end of my term, and Bob, I'm setting a big goal for you, 4,000 by the end of Dr. Juhas' term. We can do it, right, Bob? Now, is this a reasonable request? Are you ready to do this? Okay. And another thing we're going to do is we're going to develop something which you've already been seeing a little bit of called osteopathic media moments. All right, an acronym, heaven. What is osteopathic media moments? O M M. All right, and this is people, this is DOs and the DO family having fun as a family, not practicing, not doing surgery, but having fun as a family. A reminder that we're, we're together, that we celebrate together, and we're going to encourage submissions, photos, videos, any type of media you'd like to do, profession-wide. They're going to be available on Facebook and YouTube. We're going to have some awards, and as my daughter would say, shout-outs for recognition for the best submissions. I'm going to leave you with one last touch point of culture, the hug. Did you ever notice how we're always hugging each other? Anybody notice? No? John Gimple, we were at a meeting with John Gimple recently. <laughs> he says, you know, I have an MD friend. And Steve, Maroon, you guys will appreciate this. He says, I have some MD friend says, you guys are always hugging each other. It's like you actually like each other. <laughs> a hug is a symbol of our unique bonds, our sense of family our belief in the power of touch. Now, many fraternal organizations have a secret handshake. We do not have one. Right? But I propose that we officially designate the DO hug as the secret handshake of our profession. I'd like to close with a short video on this subject. I do think it qualifies as an osteopathic media moment, but I'll let you be the judge of that. As they say, let's roll them. Brother? I'm going to have a brother? I've always dreamed about having a brother. Speak of the devil. Oh, brother! <laughs> brother? I'm Paul. You must be Tommy. Brothers don't shake hands. Brothers got a hug. <laughs> I did 48 months classes, got a stethoscope for a necktie. A brand new degree on the flip side And my D.O. bros are along for the ride Got a brand new D.O. after my name It's D.O. hug that gives me the prize Come on, take a little walk, tell the D.O.s Tell me, who do you hug? Yeah, who do you hug? Around the town, I use my OMT Take it easy, baby, when you're hugging on me Who do you hug? Who do you hug? Palpate hand 
in a D.O. mine I'm just out of school and I don't mind flying Who do you hug? Yeah, who do you hug? Yeah, who do you hug now? A.T. took me by the hand He said, non dios they don't understand Who do you hug? The days were dark and the nights were blue Down the hallway a gurney flew I ran a code and then somebody screamed I need a hug after what I'd seen Who do you hug? Who do you hug? Yeah, who do you hug? I said, who? hug now I got a palpating hand and a D.O. mind just out of school and I'm already flying. Dio shoes, baby, put them on your feet. Got the OMT music and the Osseo beat. Who do you hug? Yeah, who do you hug now? Did they do a great job or what? You're just amazing, huh? That was really good. There's Steve Bander, our man. He sang that. Sure, we have challenges. <laughs> People like Steve, and no, I'm just kidding, Steve. We can turn challenges into opportunities. We have a history of doing this. When I was a kid, my father used to say, you know, DOs, they'll go into the areas where nobody ever wants to go, and they make successes of themselves. That's what we did in inner cities. That's what we've done in rural health. And we'll do it again, and we're going to keep doing it. We're going to follow our plan. It's a road to the future. We're going to use our guiding principles as signposts. We're going to focus on the bright spots, and we're going to celebrate and strengthen our culture. It's the glue that holds us together. So let's continue our journey together as we prepare for the future. We are the solution. I look forward to working with you over the next year, and thank you for your support. And don't forget to fill out those forms before you leave, okay? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vin. I look forward to a very fantastic year with you at the helm. Please be sure to come with us to celebrate, uh, Doctor, at 6.30 in the International Ballroom on Level 2. Tomorrow is the important election process. I expect everyone to be here in your seats. Like we said, we're going to give you a break till 8 o'clock because of all your efforts in the morning, ready to go to elect a new slate of officers. The House stands in recess till 8 o'clock tomorrow morning. Thank you. I did 48 months classes, got a stethoscope for a necktie, a brand new degree on the flip side, and my D.O. bros are along for the ride, got a brand new D.O. after my name, it's D.O. Hug that gives me the prize, come on take a little walk, tell the D.O.s, tell me who do you hug? Yeah, who do you hug? 
around the town to use my OMT. Take it easy, baby, when you're hugging on me. Who do you hug? Who do you hug? Got a palpating hand and a D.O. mind. I'm just out of school and I don't mind flying. Who do you hug? Yeah, who do you hug? Yeah, who do you hug now? Now, A.T. took me by the hand. He said, non dios they don't understand. Who do you hug? The days were dark and the nights were blue. Down the hallway a gurney flew. I ran a code and then somebody screamed. I need a hug after what I'd seen. Who do you hug? Who do you hug? Yeah, who do you hug? I said, who do you hug now? Got a palpating hand and a D.O. mind. I'm just out of school and I'm already flying. D.O. shoes, baby, put them on your feet. Got the OMT music and the Osseo beat. Who do you hug? Yeah, who do you hug now?